Today is full of opportunity. Today is full of opportunity to connect with others, grow as a community, and even improve lives. And ARP is in Nevada, helping to make it all happen with resources to help you steer clear of fraud, helping to make our community accessible for all, and fun and educational events all over our state. Because ARP has real value for you, your family, and for everyone in Nevada. So let's take on today together. Learn more at facebook.com slash AARPNV. Good morning, Nevada. Uh, my name is Justin Chavez. I'm the director for outreach for ARP Nevada. I want to thank you all for joining us on this live interactive Q&A. We have today director producer Dave Mueller and producer writer Lynn Salt um, of the independent film Oildale. Now, our ARP Nevada members uh, saw this movie about two weeks ago. We uh, viewed this movie on May 8th, which was great for um, especially what we have going on this weekend, which is uh, Memorial Day weekend. Now, quick backstory, ARP Nevada is a nonprofit organization. We have over 340,000 members statewide. And what ARP Nevada is well known, is, especially ARP in general, is to promote health and well-being of older adults. And we've been doing that for over 60 years. Now, what many uh, people don't know is over 4 million of those members are veterans and or currently serving in the nation's armed forces. Um, for all of you joining today and viewing right now, we want to salute you and thank you for your service and sacrifice. As a veteran myself, um, I can't um, say that more, more meaningful than that. Now, uh, many of the resources that we're going to talk today uh, can be found on ARP.org. Um, again, that website is ARP.org. You can find the latest local resources on our local page at ARP.org slash NV. Uh, we update that frequently. And finally, please look at our free resources specifically tailored for those that have served or sacrificed for America, our great uh, veterans, military, and their families. And that website is ARP.org slash veterans. Now, before we begin today, uh, this is an interactive Q&A. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question, please type it in the comment box on either the YouTube or Facebook page that you are viewing today. Again, to ask a question, please type your comment in the box and we will um, ensure that we can pass those questions along to Lynn and David. Now, if you're just joining us, my name is Justin Chavez for ARP uh, Nevada. I wanna welcome you to this live interactive Q&A with the makers of Oildale. Now, before I introduce our guests, uh, let us go ahead and view the trailer, uh, which we again saw uh, two weeks ago. Today, we are gathered together to pay a tribute to a departed comrade. Oil Dale is a movie about a young girl and her 13-year-old brother who have to move their grandfather into a rest home and try to survive. Our mom died five years ago. Dad left us with cramps. The only income you've had is your grandfather's checks. I know the feeling of being a veteran, of being sort of detached from what you did and what you knew, and making your way in the world, and you have something to be proud of besides the hardship. Looking for a place. I have a room for rent. The story is really about reality and music healing and people struggling but coming together to find a better time, a better life. So, you the war veteran? I am. Our grandpa is in the World War II. We're kind of following the tale of these two young kids, but we're getting a broader message about the veterans, specifically in the background. This is the place with the room for rent. I saw it on the board at the VA office. Why don't you come up and sit with us for a while? There's human beings struggling to survive and then struggling to take care of each other. You're home now, brother. I'm standing guard. We're all about educating. We don't want people to be afraid of us. We want them to accept us. Do you think I can sing? Yes, you can. The film's about going for your dreams, about family, about never give up. I've been on my own for the last five years, so I don't feel like anyone's little girl. It's a beautiful film that went full circle. I'm going home to see my mother. Veterans are part of everybody's family. 
It's so many aspects that really can touch every single family to be able to relate to. I'm just going over. Such a great movie, such a great movie. Uh, so let us go ahead and introduce our distinguished guests today. Uh, first off, we have again, uh, director, producer, David Mueller and producer, writer, Lynn Salt. Um, David and, and Lynn, please take a couple minutes and introduce yourself to our viewing public, please. Uh, thank you, Justin. First of all, thank you and AARP for having us on and for, uh, I mean, it was your idea to screen the movie for your members in Nevada. We really appreciate that and uh, we're grateful. So thank you. Uh, my name is David Mueller. I'm the director and one of the producers uh, of the film Oildale and uh, we live in La Quinta, California. We're looking forward to uh, to answering some questions about the movie. And I'm Lynn Salt. I am the writer, producer, one of the producers also. And um, <laughs> we're so grateful to J J Justin for doing this for us to reach out to all of you, especially veterans. Um, as the questions come, you'll find that both my parents were World War II veterans and dad was in Korea. My heart goes out to all the families who lost someone in any war. My heart goes out to our military people because I was a, a, a military brat, they called us. Um, we're all very special people, especially our veterans, combat veterans, and the struggle is real. And this movie was made for them and for the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you both for having us on the show. And uh, you touch on, this, on a very important topic, which is our, our veterans. Um, this Monday we celebrate Memorial Day, so um, I'd love to maybe take a, a couple seconds real quick and uh, just hold a little moment of silence for our veterans, um, for those that have passed away, you're not forgotten, as well as our first responders and our um, um, doctors and nurses out there that are currently helping us all out right now. You know, you, you're all in our thoughts and prayers too, so let's take a little good three seconds of silence. All right. Well, if you are just joining us right now, my name is Justin Chavez for ARP Nevada. I want to welcome you to this live interactive Q&A with the producers and the director of Oildale, um, as well as the writer. And uh, if you're just joining us in this interactive Q&A, just go ahead and type your question in the comment box on either Facebook or YouTube. And uh, we will have one of our, our staff members go ahead and, and get that question passed over to us so we can ask us. Um, so, since we're beginning right now, let us go ahead and get into some questions that we had from, from a few of our movie, um, movie uh, viewers. Uh, our members love this movie, and uh, so good question for you both. How did you come up with the idea for your film, Oildale? Mm -hmm. uh, we were living in Los Angeles. We've been partners for 20 years, so we know each other very well. We have similar tastes in movies and all kinds of things. and we would escape LA to go to Bakersfield, which is where Oildale is, to dance the two-step at the Crystal Palace to get just a break from the big city. We both love Merle Haggard's music. We both like um, Buck Owens, and, and so David would get us in the car in a couple hours. We'd end up in Bakersfield, and we'd spend the night, and we'd go and, and enjoy a two-step. We both decided at that point, at some point in time, we want to write something that we could go there and shoot the film. Do you want to add to that or no, you're all right? No, that, that sums it up. We, we spent a lot of time in Bakersfield, yeah. and we just uh, loved the area, wanted to do something that uh, incorporated the feeling tone of Bakersfield, which we loved going to because it was so different from mm -hmm. L.A. Really, it's two hours north, but it has such a different feel. It has a very small-town American feel, and a lot of that comes from the Dust Bowl when people you know, migrated out to California, during that time, and they they settled primarily in the you know the South Central Valley, which is Bakersfield. So they brought a lot of their customs and a lot of their music with them. So we wanted to, uh, and we went through several iterations of the story, but we wanted to do something that was set in that sort of environment, the um, the Bakersfield sound, the music, the the remnants of the Dust Bowl, Central Valley, small town America. Well, you know, he, our Nevadans loved uh, the music from this from this movie. Uh, you know, we have a lot of country uh, fans out here, and it was heavily teamed towards three quarters in the movie. 
And so I know for sure I enjoyed it a lot. And and I wonder if anybody did some line dance dancing. Now we have a couple questions popping up. A really good questions from Camille. Thank you, Camille, for asking this question. How can how can future viewers watch this movie? Uh, situation. Uh, we had a Heartland tour that we were in full swing, being very successful going out. The word of mouth was spreading and we were taking it across the country. And um, of course, as everyone else knows, we were completely shut down uh, with, with the uh, COVID virus situation. So the Heartland tour is on hold, but we have a lot of plans for um, potentially streaming and uh, licensing a DVD. Mm -hmm. We're not sure if theaters are, are going to be open anytime soon, so we're going to make it available for people inside their homes. We're also hopefully hopeful that since the wonderful people of AARP had invited us to screen it to the membership there, Justin, thank you, and Mary and Maria, that possibly there will be other states that might express interest. Um, we also hope to work with organizations, service organizations, that will in particular get this out to the veterans groups. Um, we were going to be visiting, and we did, in fact, small towns where organizations that served veterans were who we were showing the film for, and they would pay us a fee, and we would help them raise money to help the local organizations serve their veterans. And so we're, we're trying to figure out that kind of a pattern again. And we'll, we will, we will. And again, uh, AARP, we're learning. I did not know that there was a wing of it that was doing what Jay, Jay, Justin's doing that is absolutely nonprofit and reaching to communities and elders and trying to help them live a good life. And I'm, we're so impressed now that we know that. Well, that's great for uh, members viewing right now. Uh, the question was how they can view the movie. Um, you know, for, for people who, who are interested in interacting with Dave and, and Lynn, feel free to go through their website. Their website is Boildale the Movie, and um, you can definitely reach out to David and Lynn and, and talk to them about that. Now, we do have a another question from Taj. Taj asks, how was the casting handle? Which is a great question. We, um, let's see, we did have a casting director who is also an actress in the film. If you've seen the film, she has a small role, but she's a very powerful actress, and she played the young woman who gave them the dog just to show you what a great actress she was. She also did our wardrobe and she helped us cast. This shows you how small our film was, how small the budget was, and how we just attracted the most brilliant talent from every direction. The casting, David and I, having written the script and these characters were living in my head, I knew who they were and David's a very talented director and very sensitive to talent when it comes in. The little boy, was 13 then as he was written. Wow. He had never acted before in his life. And we literally put out a, is there anybody who knows a 13 year old living in Bakersfield? Because we knew he'd have to be near his parents. And most of our actors came from LA and we were just wondering, and he's the only child whose mother sent a picture back and we went to see him and we knew in five minutes that he, he was gonna be uh, right for this role. He'd never acted in his life. When you watch this film, you will see what is called natural talent. We actually had a Disney representative come to see one of the screenings and that's what he said. The other actress, Jessica, unbelievable talent, some training, but unbelievable talent. And then you realize you've got a very talented actress like Jessica who plays Carly, his older sister. And you set her with <laughs> the young actor and they just enveloped each other. And then there's a brilliant actor's director who gets out of the way and allows it. And if they need help, they'll step in, but he allowed it. And that's what a talented actor's director is. Well, he was fabulous. You're, you're, you, <laughs> the, and the actors you picked were amazing, which is a good question that we have from, from Mary. Mary's loved this movie. She called it a fabulous movie. And she asked what the process was when you were choosing the characters in the story. Okay, for me, <laughs> Okay, how deep to go here? I we lost. Go as our deep old, as you like, please. My, I'm a, from a family of five girls. We were military, as I said. Dad went to West Point, so our entire life was military. We didn't know there was an outside world. Um, my mother and father lost their first child, which was a boy, and then the rest of us were girls. So we all missed our brother. We'd never met him, of course. My idea as a writer is I wanted to imagine if I had had a little brother, what he would be like. And this little boy is actually a composite of my dad, who was born in 1911. So 
you're getting that when you hear him say uh, certain words, they're coming out of that generation. And when the audience gently laughs and the role goes across, because I'm reaching toward my dad and that generation of veterans and just all, all people who have lived a long life and uh, that helps. So Jessica was really a conglomeration of three of my sisters, including me about how tough life can be. Also my mother who grew up in Oklahoma, she's Native American, struggled, had to be very strong. So those were my two key characters. When the Vietnam veterans were coming back, it knocked me over. We had retired, dad had, and we had moved out to California. They were so poorly treated. It was so horrible to me. I could not believe they, the names they were calling them, how badly they made them feel and that the, the uniforms came off because they didn't want to be spit on or attacked. And, and I knew then that one day I wanted to do something. I didn't know it would be this to make sure another generation coming forward understood what the draft was, understood that our soldiers do not decide whether it's a good war or a bad war or a right war, as history will prove in time, and that's personal opinion, that these human beings, our military, are only in that job to serve and protect the American way and to do what they're told, and we need them to do that, and they were so young. So when you see this movie at the very end, the character Larry lives on the street, he speaks. He speaks directly to our hearts. The other veteran who I didn't get to get this into the script, we had to trim it down because of budget, was the one that was broken back. He's supposed to represent the POWs because I thought people don't even know, do we still have POWs? Yes. Are we aware of them now? No, not really. And again, for the younger generation, POW and his back was broken. He didn't get into that he was tortured. But most of the Vietnam veterans would look at that and could put two and two together. And then the young Iraq veteran, I hadn't met any Iraq veterans until I wrote it. We took it in and an Iraq vet looked at it and he was just, this is it. And he was so wonderful. He helped me with a couple of words to make it more realistic, but he said, you nailed it. And so I'm grateful that I was able to do that. I think I was channeling from above my parents and uh, whatever. And I'm grateful to have had the opportunity and have been able to work with a partner who's such a good director and so sensitive to all of this that we feel like we made the film that that I wrote and that he could see. And I think, uh, yeah, I should let him talk. <laughs> yeah, I would just add one more thing that uh, I think um, knowing Lynn so well that her, the inspiration for Pete, the young boy, mm -hmm. uh, came from a mixture of her father and also her nephew who was awesome. lived with her 92 year old or actually 102 year old um, when he passed grandfather he was, he when he passed. For so the, uh, and uh, I've known him for year, 20 years as well. He picked up a lot of the speech habits of a, of a man that was born at the turn of the century. <laughs> right. And so we, one of the whole, uh, I guess the feeling tone that we wanted to bring to Oildale was more of an old, old fashioned or uh, nostalgic uh, look back. And so Pete, as a young 13 year old boy, he might use some phrases that have come from a 92 year old uh, grandfather. So that was, uh, I, I love that part of Pete's character. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Oh, young I, I loved it as well. Yeah. Thank you. It was welcome. No, and I, the other, I really did. The actors, you know. If I can say about the other actors, cause I didn't mean to such focus every actor that came in, um, some of them were military. They didn't even tell us because they were a little worried because especially the Vietnam veterans, there were two of them and they didn't know if that would help them or hurt them. Of course, afterwards when we found out, we were like, fantastic. Um, and they bring a depth. When you look at those two actors, especially, they bring a depth when you look into their eyes. Not that the others aren't really, really good too because they're all very sensitive, highly talented actors and it shows you how many wonderful actors are out there and we just don't make enough movies or we don't make enough of the right movies that would make use of their talent which david and i hope to make more that are going to be open to this kind of talent well, one more note on casting just mm -hmm. in general is it uh, we both feel that it's so important and they say casting is destiny it's just such an important part of the creative process and uh, we were so fortunate to have um, christine thomas christine. Who, who helped us cast it yes. and then Lynn and I worked very collaboratively together uh, in the casting sessions. Uh, Lynn would actually read the sides mm -hmm. to, to the actors and the actresses that came in and uh, we would both discuss them uh, you know and we were so fortunate to get really very very quality 
talented actors uh, on this movie. And one of the stories, if you want to hear, we don't have a lot of funny stories because we shot this in 14 days. It was freezing and, and it was a lot of hard work. But one of the stories in casting anyway was two kids were brought in by their mom. The little boy wasn't right. He was, they're very talented. And she, when she left, our casting director goes, I think that's Mrs. Renzel. And we went, get her. <laughs> he ran up to her, brought her in. And she, she hadn't been a trained actress, but she had totally given up on it. She was also, a, had been a Marine for eight years and oh, all wow. her focus on her kids. But she sat down and she kept trying to fix her hair. And then we just said, it's okay, it's okay, just please read. And she was Mrs. Renzel. And Mrs. Renzel is the name of my freshman high school teacher that I loved. So, you know, as writers, and writers out there will know, and David knows, if you can start bringing the threads, you know, of people you care about and think about your dad, what my little brother would have been like, my nephew, the humor, and just start bringing those characters in until they're living inside of you. You can <laughs> any story you can write, but the characters uh, are very important. Yes. Oh, I loved it. Oh, go ahead. Just. All right. No, no, no. I, I, I was just, screaming. just one more point on the casting and Lynn brought this up, but we were so fortunate to have real veterans playing mm -hmm. veteran roles. Mm -hmm. And we didn't tr set out to do that, although that would have been optimal for us. Mm -hmm. We just took the best actors and they didn't tell us that they were veterans. Mm -hmm. we, like Lynn said, we learned later. Um, but it just added a whole nother dimension to the to the film. Yes. Oh, thank you so much, and and I'm biased, so I'm I'm thankful that you that you uh, hired a marine for the job. You know, for <laughs> directors and and writers out there, please do that more. Um, we have a great question, um, but before we get to the question, just reminding everybody out there viewing, um, my name is Justin. I'm with ARP Nevada. Right now, we have the makers of Oildale, the producer, and the writer directors, and that's uh, David and Lynn. And if you're just joining, this is an interactive Q&A. So please, if you want to ask a question, just type it in the comment box, either on Facebook or YouTube, whichever platform you're viewing, and we will try our best to get to that question. Now, we have a great question from Mike. Um, this was one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And this was the joke about steak. How did you come up with the steak line? Because I thought that was a, a, one of the funniest scenes in the movie. Well, hmm. So I, my father and mother were meat eaters and my dad loved meat. And I always, my sister, as we got older, she goes, mom, you gave us too much meat. David and I really like meat too. And so I, I just became part of the little boy that he really, he's growing. He's worried he's going to be short for the rest of his life. And by the way, it's so amazing. His mother, the actor's mother said, because I had the line, I'm going to be short for the rest of my life if I don't get meat. She goes, he just said that to me last week. You know, so <laughs> again, I tapped in. I've never, I don't have a little brother, but my heart just reached to this character and this little boy embodied him. He likes me too. And that's what he was thinking of. He's hungry. And, you know, vegans and vegetarians who are grownups who are doing that for themselves and for whatever reason, and I don't want to get political, it's really important to understand, in my opinion, that growing children need the nutrition if they can get it. It's just my opinion that meat's really important. Part of uh, military, I mean, my dad, maybe it was because of that, but we were Catholic. So the only night we ate fish was fish sticks on Fridays, and dad was good about that. He was a good Catholic. But other than that, Mom made meat every single night. And if my sisters and I look good for our age, I think it's because we had a good time. <laughs> anyway. Hope it's, all, it's also, a, for his character, a symbol that yeah. he uh, they can't afford it. Right. And so showing that they, they that he aspires to have a good steak yeah, and they just someday. can't afford it. Yeah. You know, and, right. and it's, a, it's, a, it's a true reality of the current situation we're in right now. You know, yes. um, there's a lot of people who can't be able to afford the, the, the uh, resources available, which gives me a great transition for those viewing right now. If you're looking for local resources in the area, I really recommend you go to our state page, arp.org slash NV. Um, we keep up to date information on resources for places you can go find um, food and, and different resources that are essential in the area. So feel free again to look at our website and um, find up to date um, information on that. Now, again, if you're just viewing us right now, my name is Justin Chavez. I'm with ARP Nevada. Uh, right now, we have this live Q&A with the makers of Oildale, and that's David and Lynn. Um, if you have a question, please, please feel free to go ahead and type it in the box, and we'll get to it um, as fast as possible. Now, we have a great question from Riley, um, and that is the mu music in the film was great, which I mentioned. I, I think all Nevadans loved it. Did the actors yeah. really sing their parts, or was that uh, voiceover? 
Uh, well, we we cast uh, actors that could sing. Mm -hmm. That was part of the audition process. It was a big part of the audition process. So they all have wonderful voices. We, we ended up uh, using some other voices occasionally and some of their voices as well. So it's a mix, um, but we, uh, we did set out to cast actors that had beautiful voices that could sing. Yes. So they all can. And that said, all of the musicians, the musicians on stage were singing and people who have seen it, Will Branch, the first singer, that's his voice. The young woman in the pink dress, that's her voice. They wrote those songs. Um, this, the, the cowgirl in the black hat, uh, um, forgetting my own character's Jessie. name, Jesse, 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 Jesse and Jessup. She does have a dynamite voice too, as does mm -hmm. Jessica. All three of our leads actually did have good voices because when we got to Bakersfield, we have a wonderful co-producer. His name is uh, Rick Davis, and he got these amazing professionals because he loved the script, and he brought them to us, and they are, everybody in the background is actually playing the music, but quietly, because they didn't want it to look like they weren't really playing, they were just pretending. So real musicians will look at that scene and go, they're really playing. When we brought our singer writers, uh, up, like uh, there's a few actors that are mostly singers, they brought the music, they brought the songs, and we actually took a song that was written by um, Grant Malloy Smith, which is America, America, that the black cowboy had a uh, cutie pie sings, and he is the singer in the background. So we were trying to get everybody on stage that actually had the talent that wrote the songs and wrote the music and blend them with our actors. And, and again, we'll say it one more time, our actors had so much talent, including uh, vocal talent, back to 12 days to shoot, and we had to move quickly. And in order to control the voices, we also added singers that could make everything rise to the high level for a $10,000 contest. And our actors, again, are great actors and good singers, but once we started getting really professional singers up there, which you see that some of them are, we just had to lift their, their game for a couple more levels just to make it all mesh. And uh, Lynn mentioned that we had a co-producer named Rick Davis, who's yeah. a Bakersfield a native, help us with the music. He, he brought world-class mm -hmm. musicians, people that have played with Buck Owens, <laughs> which we were thrilled about because we love the Bakersfield sound. Uh, and just world-class musicians to be in that band scene Hmm. which incidentally for the film lovers that uh, this is just a little tidbit we that was the most complicated scene in the movie the the, the band and we had the audience Contest. of 400 people and we had all the band members and you know scenes going on on stage that whole uh section of the movie was scheduled for day 1 the first day of our shooting and we we shot it all at the Fox Theater in Bakersfield hmm on day one with world-class musicians that Rick Davis helped bring to us. And it, it just, uh, 400 people showed up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from, from the local Bakersfield area. So we, we love Bakersfield because the Bakersfield town, they didn't even know exactly what the movie was, but they came, they sat there, they listened to a director, clapped the and they just did it. And then the hero song is Fog of War. That has a little story too, but we just, David just said, just listen. And that's where you're getting all those reaction shots from real people from Bakersfield in the audience who are listening with their hearts. And when the emotion rises, it's real uh, for the fog of war, which is what the hero song is in the film. Without giving it right. away, right? <laughs> Completely. So that's music. And mu like I said before, we wanted music to be an integral part of the movie. Yeah. And of course, she sings the songs to her little brother and, and uh, enters the song contest. But it, it culminates sort of in that big uh, song contest at the very end on stage with the, all the musicians. Yeah. yeah. Now, we, we do have a, a great question. Um, but before we go to that question, I just want to remind everybody that we're at a live interactive Q&A with the makers of Oildale. Um, if you have a question, please type it in YouTube or Facebook, whatever platform you're viewing right now, and we'll get to that question. Um, in relation to the music, a few years ago when I lived in Arizona, I had a great chance to go to my first bluegrass concert, and that was amazing. Mm -hmm. So it, it, your, your elements almost hit me a little bit like that too. Um, now we have a, a great question from Janice. Um, she's actually... Uh, part of a great group called Cinemaniacs. Um, yeah. Now, do you have any personal relationships with a vet 
who has had traumatic brain injury, since you felt it important to highlight it as an affliction that affects many war veterans? And that's just a great question. Yeah, it is a great question. And I wrote the character not realizing it was called a TBI, not realizing how prevalent it was. I really didn't because I wasn't, I was more focused on the Vietnam vets. And then my dad was in Korea and mom and dad in World War II. So my brain kind of stayed around that. But I knew I wanted him in the original script. He spoke very slowly and haltingly. And as we cast, we, we talked it over and I said, I think it's going too slow. And we just altered it to the actor and he knew to go slower and slow motion because he understood he had a TBI. It was Julio, mm, Torres. Julio Torres, Julio Torres, who plays Jimmy the orderly in the hospital, who takes care of veterans who actually looked at the script and he said, I said, he's got a brain damage. And he goes, you mean a TBI? And that's the first time I heard it. As soon as he said that, I, I said, I'm going to write that in because people don't know. I don't know. A lot of people don't know. What's a TBI? What's a TBI? So we put it in with the hope that people would learn from it. And the actor, again, was not a vet, but just a very talented actor. And uh, he actually, again, Took, took that and we, we, so you learn as you make movies, we had a very special makeup artist do a scar behind his ear and we realized later we didn't quite make it big enough so nobody notices, but for the actor, right? He, mm -hmm. he had the benefit of that, knowing that was there and there's so much you can do to help the actors, but again, the actors are so, were so good it wouldn't have mattered. But anyway, yes, and Julio said to us, mm, it broke my heart because he said, because he was working on set with us, he did our security, he brought Bo the dog in, he's a dog trainer, and he said, if you ever look over at me and I'm just standing there, just let me stand there because sometimes my whole body will lock up. And I was just looking at him like, I didn't understand. And he says, it's just part of the experience and then I will be all right. And as we brought the actor playing Mark, the Iraq vet, to Julio, the two of them had a lot more to talk about, about when you see, I'm giving this movie away if anybody hasn't seen it, when you see the actor go into the epileptic fit or you know the brain trauma goes on, we weren't sure how to do it. And we talked to him again and he said, first my eyeballs felt like they were gonna explode. Then I had the worst headache in my life. And the actor went with it and then Julio would watch. I mean, he watched Gramps' funeral scene because he knew uh, my mom and dad were buried in Arlington. I knew the, the reason that scene is there is for a lot of purposes. One of them was I wanted to share with as many people who could see it, the beauty and the power of a military funeral. And I realized not a lot of people get to see that. So I thought, let's, let's show them if they don't or if they haven't. The other reason that scene is in there is because my older sister lost her husband at a young age with, and he did not have a will. And that threw us into an unbelievable tizzy because she was in grief. She couldn't think straight and it caused problems. It worked out in the end after a year. So I was like, if this movie can help anybody understand and see how and why wills are so important, then that would be a positive thing too. Oh, that you just touched uh, uh, a lot of topics. I mean, um, first off, it's a great, I personally loved it the fact that you had so many different eras on, on this film because every single era is different um yet we're all connected i, I know when i watch um, any um military funeral i i can't compose myself i mm -hmm. saw quite a few in the military um and you really touch on a very important topic that i personally think um and it's it's going to see like I'm, I'm i'm plugging but it's it's the truth one of the areas that we try as a nonprofit to really promote is, is the necessity of caregiving. And one element of caregiving is planning for end of life. And this movie really, and I think that was something I, I talked to you personally about and, and from my own personal experience, how important it is to properly plan at the end is something that if you don't do, can have um, extreme consequences and a trickle effect. And there is a scene, and I really don't want to um, sell it out for people who haven't watched the movie, but there's a very important scene with the grandfather in this movie. And um, if he did not plan for, for end of life and doing something very simple like doing his will, the ramifications that would affect the family household. Um, and that's a question for you both. This movie touches heavily on caregiving. Um, was that something that 
came from your personal experience? Was that something you were conscious of when you were creating the film? How did this element of caregiving, although it's a very veteran focus film, I really believe that a very heavy focus of this film is about caregiving. How, how did you guys plan for this in the movie or did it just come off organically? For me, again, as the writer, um, I guess as you feel your parents are aging, even with five girls, we all had totally different lives. Uh, some had children, some didn't. I was traveling a lot and we were all thinking and wondering how it would work out and what we would do if they got to the stage where they needed more help. And my mother unfortunately died of cancer younger uh, than my pop and dad lived another 20 years. And he ended up living with my younger sister. They had the room, they had young children that benefited greatly by having dad there. But I think what it made me think about is not everybody has that. Not everybody, you know, both parents are working and the ch children are at school. Maybe that's a good idea if there's room, maybe it isn't. And taking <laughs> the idea and my imagination of what it would feel like, that's why I opened the movie with it, what it would feel like for a young 18 year old to say to her 13 year old brother, and they both adore their gramps, but the 13 year old gramps is his dad, he's his best friend, he's everything, to a home because she has to work and he has to be in school and Gramps is losing sense of time, place. And in the book that I'm writing, it explains that when she comes home at one time, he's, she can't find him and he's wandering in the oil fields looking for his wife because he's losing his, his ability to stay in present time. And, and the wonderful thing about the will is the woman that plays the Marine, that is the Marine that plays Mrs. Renswell, my instinct was when she brings, when they take him to her, and we all feel safe, because I didn't want anybody to be worrying about Gramps, we feel safe with this woman, she understands. And as you see the movie, you'll see that the grown-ups around these two young children who feel like they're all by themselves in the world and they're gonna do fine, and they do. The veterans are watching over them. Mrs. Renzel's watching over them. And as Gramps has been watching over them, and they lost their mother young and their dad's not a good dad. Sorry, he's not. And you'll find out when you see the movie more in detail about that. But it, it is so important for especially the COVID virus thing that happened. It, it's shocking and stunning. It's not a matter of can I put them in an expensive one and they'll be better off or, you know, oh, I put them in one that they didn't really take care of them. Everybody's heart is with our parents grandparents to make sure they're going to be okay. That's why the numbers of death in the, the nursing homes is, is so upsetting to all of us, because even if we had our parents or grandparents at home, we can imagine if we hadn't. And our heart goes out to every single person who lost someone in those nursing homes. But, but planning in future now how to make them safer, and I, and I guess if AARP does that too, um, to have someone you can talk to, like Mrs. Renzel, to say, look, here's some ideas. You probably need a will. You probably need this um, to help people understand that they need to do that. Look, as a military man, and my parents were military, they knew they could have died over there. They knew they could have gotten called up again, and they knew they had five kids. So they were thinking very carefully early on about that. A lot of people don't. A lot of people should learn, if that you can, from this movie or from our wonderful veterans who really know a lot more than we're letting them tell us. Uh, great point. Um, and, and for people viewing right now, um, I know we've been over the time period. We're supposed to stop at 1030, but we had so many great questions. We just had to go a little bit more longer. But uh, for those viewing right now, I really want to direct you to our www.arp.org slash caregiving page. Um, it is a, a great page for you to be able to find end of life planning, um, a lot of resources that are touched on in this movie. Um, and we do have a planning guide specifically for veterans. So for those who may be interested in starting the process, I know personally myself, um, that was something that I shied away from for quite a long time. And as my family gets older and, and as we get older as people, we start realizing things that we thought were not important are, are extremely important. So for those viewing right now, we have the the website on the bottom of the screen. Feel free to go on there and there's a lot of free, all the all the resources on there 
um, are free for um, the planning guides and things of that nature. Now, um, we are towards the end of the show, but I do want to ask one or two more questions. And if you're just joining this live Q&A, if you want to ask a question, please type it in the comment box on Facebook or YouTube. Again, my name is Justin Chavez. I'm with AARP Nevada, and I'm right now with the makers of Oildale. Um, and there, one question I want to ask is more about the relationship that you both have as a writer um, and as a director. You're both producers, but you know you have someone who creates a script, and you have somebody who has to transition this script to the uh, full film that we viewed right now. How did that process go? How were you able to, you know, I'm sure you had to probably take stuff out of the script, add stuff in as a director. Um, how how did that uh, relationship happen So as so far as we're creating both, the film? Right, we're both actually writers and we're both DGA members, meaning professional directors. Um, we've actually co-directed a documentary about the American Indian movement. Uh, we co-produced, directed a little piece that was over in Africa. Because I wrote this, and when I decided I wanted to make it actually, then I got to choose the director and work with David as a, actually as a collaborative director, you would call it, it isn't the director, but we were right together. We cast together, we, we edited together with the editor, we chose the music together, we, um, the sound and everything because it gave me a better opportunity to work with a director who's more experienced than I am to bring my game up. And he's a very good guy to study with and to be close to, but I am a director and I intend to direct some of my other scripts. I would, I would like to co-direct, but we'll see how David feels about it. David asked me, <laughs> David, well, David asked me if, yeah, if I would co-direct this with him. And I was like, because my head was so into the writing and characters and because his talents are very great, I thought I'll be right next to you and I'm going to absorb. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing he did to me and for, for the actors, actually, it's very rare to have a writer on the set, but producers, yeah. But he said, we're going very quickly. Lynn knows the veterans. If you have questions, ask her. The little boy, because he was working with so many of the other actors, I worked with him because I've also trained as an actor to try to help him understand you need to listen, you need to not hurry and let the other actors watch what they're doing because you're gonna learn and he's quite brilliant. So, I mean, it was yeah. a wonderful experience for-, for uh, I would just us. echo what Lynn said that we're very, very collaborative and have been since we met 20 years ago <laughs> and uh, have been inseparable. We're sort of hand in glove and we're both writers both directors, yep. both producers. I started out making movies oh, 25, 30 years ago, mostly documentaries, and then I, I cut my teeth in New York on some episodic television shows, directing action sequences with all the principal actors, which was a, a crucible for me to learn how to shoot quickly and uh, in a big machine. But we really want to tell our own stories, so we're, we're both... Um, we both have a lot of scripts uh, that we've written together and separately, and we would like to make eventually. So uh, we're very, um, it, it, it's a creative process. It works differently in every case, but Lynn is a beautiful writer. I love the story Oil Dell, and we, like she said, we just, um, we made it together. Really. And an amazing director. And again, some directors don't like that. It's very difficult. <laughs> For it women is. to get close enough to the process, oftentimes writers are a little different if you just sell the script and you're not there. Some directors don't want writers on the set because they think they'll get in the way and some actors don't know what to do with you either. We had a very good education process for our, our crew especially, but the actors understood immediately. If they had a question, I had the lead actor uh, who played Mark, he came to me and he said, I don't think this is quite right. And it was a scene I had actually written for a different song to be introduced. And I just looked at it and I sat down and I said, you're right. And he goes, I'll leave you alone because he appreciated it. And I, I cut it. And right before they shot it, because they were in such a hurry, I said, I cut the scene down, David goes fine. He trusted me completely as I trusted him to take my heartfelt characters and make them exactly the way, I mean, that movie is exactly the way I wrote it. And, and, and he did it and I knew he could. I would not have given this, there were other directors who wanted the script and we held it back and we made it with our own money. And we did the best we could to, you know, to stretch our pennies, but no other director would have been able to do the job that he did because he understood me, he understood the characters, and he's a really fine director. Well, a lot of uh, productions will not want the writer on the set. Um, there's some reputation with that. But I, to me, it's, it, was, it is a joy because who knows those characters better 
of course, the director has to interpret those, but the writer, the writer's mind is so full of that character. Lynn just sat down with the actors and said, listen, this is what the character's th thinking. And we would work, we did a lot of rehearsals together. Again, very collaboratively, but we went through the script, made sure all the actors knew their, their roles and understood them on multiple layers. And then on set, as questions came up from certain actors, Lynn could sit down with them and say, here's, here's the multi-layered depth to this character. Yeah, and if I may- and I, I, I was involved as well, but I, did, I had no qualms about turning them over to Lynn. And, and I, I'm just gonna say this from being a writer for a long time and seeing movies a lot in my life and moving toward directing more and more. One of the biggest dangers that happens and a lot of people don't understand the value of having a writer and they can get in the way. I can see that too, if they think they 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 understand it better than the director. But once you have a partnership like this, actors, some very, very good actors will read a script and think they understand the character better. And if the writer's not there and the director doesn't have time to say, no, you're going in that direction and it's not gonna work in the end. If they can't say that to them, sometimes the editing drops scenes out and the movie doesn't make sense. And people went, what happened? That script was great. And that's what we prevented. And a couple of cases where we both had to say, I said, please tell him. And he'd say, okay. And then he'd come back to me, please tell them, this is what the character's thinking, not what you think, because that's not gonna work because we're editing in our brain and we know what the scenes are. And I think it's a really strong thing to actually have the writer. Oftentimes writers become directors because they can't find directors who can do this. So we're very, very mm -hmm. lucky. Um, and co-directing co would be very impossible probably for most people, but you know there's a lot of Coen brothers and people out there. Uh, we haven't seen the sisters yet, but the two of us, again, feel like it's going to be a, a positive and wonderful experience. To well, I'm sure everyone knows you. that filmmaking is an extremely collaborative process. Absolutely. You need so many people to make a movie, right. and everyone has to bring their talents to it. We were so lucky to have found amazing crew and cast yes. in front of the camera and behind the camera. We, we really couldn't have done it without yeah. just super talented people because we'd shot this film very quickly um, over the space of two weeks, basically, mm -hmm. uh, six, two six day weeks and um, on a very low limited budget. So yeah. we, we had to have great talent bef in front of and behind the camera, and it, oh, which sorry. we did. And if I can say, because this advice was given to me when I first got to Hollywood, Los Angeles, and this is true. If you want to be a filmmaker, you need to, if you possibly can, write an original script. The script is what everybody read, and then they wanted to work with us, because that is the blueprint. The script is what brought the actors in, the right ones. We were looking for innocence and, and all this other thing. That I needed that innocence. I put it in there, and we couldn't have had a slick Hollywood actor try to be innocent, and so we found that kind of talent. If you don't have a script that you own, I'm just going to give this good advice. It took me years, but I learned it. You will have to buy a book, option it, and they usually give you a couple of years, and so then you're writing your script, and by the time you write the script, the option might run out, and they're going to want more money. Okay? And then you have to pay them a big lump sum when you make the movie because it was their script, it was their book, okay? So my best advice for filmmakers is train yourself, teach yourself to write or get a partner who can write. Fortunately, we both write. <laughs> write a script that your heart wants to make so you're willing to, to jump off a cliff like we did holding hands, taking our savings because we believed in this movie. And then everybody who came toward us from the actors to the crew, to the producers, to the singers, gave us their songs for next to nothing actually and the writer everybody worked for next to nothing they were attracted to the script and then the director the old-fashioned tendency toward wanting to make an old-fashioned script there's there's no sex there's no violence there's not even a kiss because we didn't need it we were doing human oh. being time. this was a this is a great film uh, you you both are uh one of the best tag teams I've seen since Starsky and Hutch. So um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to a, to a lot more movies from you all. I know we're reaching towards the end and we had a few questions, but in all honesty, I, I think during your conversation, you actually answered a few that came from our, our viewing members. Um, we had a great compliment just now from Taj who wanted to thank you all for the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of our members, as, as we shared with you, emailed us privately. They let us know how much they loved the movie, how much it was, if not entertaining and needed at this time, if not, 
it was extremely important for them to just recognize a few elements that, that I think we forget from time to time. So, um, you know, on behalf of ARP Nevada, I really want to thank you both thank you. for allowing us to be able to view this to our members. Um, I think we had an extremely fun and important time during during the, these these last few weeks, especially with Memorial, Memorial Day coming up. Um, and unfortunately, we're out of time, but I do want to not only thank you, but thank everybody who viewed today's Q&A. Um, and I want to spend a couple couple um, minutes for you both to end any closing remarks. We'd love to know if you have any movies coming up or any projects or anything else you'd like to um, tell our viewing members for right now. Yes. Well, we do have... Well, as I mentioned before, we have quite a few scripts uh, written together and separately that we hope to make. So uh, stay tuned. L Lynn is working on a, on one that's in the same vein as, as Oildale, and uh, well, that would be following this one up most likely. Hopefully sooner than later, but um, because of the whole um, shutdown and lockdown, we, we were forced to come off of our Heartland tour. So uh, it delayed things a little bit, but we're still on track to get our next one out there. Probably, well, we're hoping within the next year, we'd hope to be into production on that. But. Right. It, it, it always gets down to budget and filmmakers. You should know that too, if that's what you're looking for. And that's why every film you make, we go out and we are trying to get our fees and we are trying to raise money for veterans as well as attention to our veterans because they are struggling and we need to help them, especially now more than ever. Um, it, it, budget's important and you need to learn about that and you need to make friends with writers, directors, producers and casts, at good actors and crew. Because once you have your crew, especially direct, you know, uh, editor, music, sound, um, the people that you can actually make the film with, there's a lot of actors, a lot of good actors out there who really will work for you. But you need to first get that script, get your partner, get your team and then move that way. And then budget, you need to, David did the budget. I'm not good at that, he's really good. And that was essential. You have to have your budget written out and everything has to be covered. So we hope a lot of people make movies now because Hollywood is closed right now and if they open up. I don't know what kind of movies they're gonna put out. They, there's some pretty wonderful movies that we both love through our life, but we think there's a turning point right now where we need to tell stories, in our opinion, more like this for families about something not just about you know horror films or comic book films, but ones that can help us laugh at ourselves, cry together, and then go, we can do it at the end. Well, well thank so. you both. Seriously, mm -hmm. thank you both. Any any uh, last remarks, David? No, um, I think Lynn summed it up very well. We we like to tell stories about. Um, I'd say if there was a theme, uh, mm -hmm. a, a healing theme. Um, that's not to say that that's the only type of movies that we make or write, but that's generally what we're drawn to. Yeah. So, um, look out for our mm -hmm. upcoming projects. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, again, I want to thank everybody for participating in today's live Q and A. Uh, I'm so sorry we weren't able to get to your question if you asked. Um, but if you have any additional questions, feel free to email um, me and my email is jchavis at arp.org and I can definitely pass that on to Lynn and David. Um, feel free to contact our office, ARP Nevada, during the regular business hours. That number is 1-866-389-5652. Uh, many of the resources referenced in today's show can be found on arp.org. Again, that web address is arp.org. You can find the latest updates on veterans as well as information tailored for older adults and family caregivers. You can also learn about local updates and resources at arp.org slash NV. Again, that's www.arp.org slash NV. And finally, please um, look at our free resources. We have resources specifically tailored for those who have served, sacrificed for America, and that's our veterans, military, and their families. That website is www.arp.org slash veterans. Um, I want to thank you all again today for joining us um, for this show, um, especially from me and everybody from the ARP Nevada team. We want to salute your service and sacrifice to our great nation for our veterans watching. Um, have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Stay safe and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Today is full of opportunity. 
to connect with others, grow as a community, and even improve lives. And ARP is in Nevada, helping to make it all happen with resources to help you steer clear of fraud, helping to make our community accessible for all, and fun and educational events all over our state. Because ARP has real value for you, your family, and for everyone in Nevada. So let's take on today together. Learn more at facebook.com slash AARPNV.